welcome to Muscle Maven Radio. I'm your host, Ashley Van Houten. This is going to be another solo episode. Um, This is the Muscle Maven's Guide to Better Sleep. And the reason I decided to try to do another short episode, we'll see, uh, and just do it by myself, um, because this is essentially an amalgamation of information and resources and tips that I have gathered over years and years and years of struggling with my sleep. Um, So most of this stuff is not uh, my idea, my invention. It's just stuff that I have found that works. um, And I've put it into a couple different categories. Um, I'm the first person to tell you that I am not a expert on sleep. I'm just someone who has struggled with it a lot. Probably that's the um, foundational piece of health and wellness that I've struggled with the most. And so I've done a fair bit of research on it in hopes that I will get better at it. And I feel like I have, I kind of go through ups and downs for sure, but um, I'm getting better at it. I'm getting more knowledgeable. I have more tools than I have had before. And so I just kind of wanted to pass this along to you guys. Um, If there's anything that I'm missing, I would love to hear what you guys think. If you have any tips for me that you think would work, I definitely want to hear them. Um, So please do uh, send me a message. You can always reach me through Instagram. That's where I'm most available. Um, My handle is at the muscle maven. You can reach out to me on my website, which is just my name, ashleyvanhouten.com. You can send me an email there. Um, I'll put that in the show notes. And, you know, share this episode with someone that you think could benefit. Um, Tag me, like, let's keep the conversation going because this is an important part of health. And it's one that I think tends to be more undervalued than the other kind of foundational elements. So, So without further ado, let's get into it. I have some notes here. I'm going to just start going through um, the categories and the things that I have found um, that help me with my sleep in general. And you're going to find that a lot of these things are also relevant to the rest of your health. So things, you know, it's not rocket science, things that help you have more energy, things that help your mood, things that um, help your gut health, things that help your, your physical performance, like they're all going to have positive effects on the rest of your health as well. So it's like, you know, I know easier said than done, but like, again, this stuff isn't magic. It's just applying these principles and doing it consistently. Okay. So first key element, we're talking about sort of, um, what, people call uh, sleep hygiene, which is essentially the setup of where you go to sleep. So your bedroom, your sleeping area, the setup and the um, kind of lead up to going to sleep. If you're somebody who's, you know, sleeping in a brightly lit room and you're listening to heavy metal and doing a hardcore workout right before you go to bed and then you eat a massive meal, like, I mean, that's suboptimal sleep hygiene, if you catch my drift. Um, So the opposite is going to be true, generally speaking. So one of the key elements here is temperature. Um, Research seems to show that cooler um, is better. And I know that this is going to be wildly dependent on where you live and your house setup. Do you have AC? Are you in the basement? Are you on the top floor? All of these things. But generally speaking, it said that keeping things around 18 degrees Celsius, 65 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal. You want the room to be like a little bit cooler than maybe feels comfortable right away. You can have all the blankets in the world, you can cuddle up, you can get in there, um, but you don't want to go into your sleep chamber and it's warm um, or you're already feeling kind of like sweaty. Um, You want it to be cooler that's going to help your body downregulate. And you can also um, get there faster by taking like maybe a cool shower before bed, um, stuff like that uh, as well. But cooler is better. Uh, White noise, a fan, these things can definitely help. Um, Again, depends on are you in a loud place? Do Do you have traffic outside your window? Are you like out in the 
farm country, whatever. Um, some people like a little bit of ambient noise, but like finding that kind of low level, not distracting sound or no sound at all is going to be great. And a fan is great for that. And then it helps with the coolness as well. Um, you can also do things if you have the ability to um, experiment with things like chili pads or these kind of cooling pads that you can put in your bed. Um, I have a chili pad and I actually quite liked it. Um, it does make a white noise noise that I didn't always love actually, because I prefer like perfect silence because um, I'm a light sleeper. Um, but things like that are absolutely have benefits and have been shown to be helpful for people. Um, so definitely experiment with stuff like that. I don't have any like partnerships with Chili Pad or anything like that, but um, they're worth looking into if you have the um, means to, to get some. So temperature, cool. A little bit cooler maybe even than you'd want. Um, lighting is another one. So light is huge. That could be an entire podcast on its own. Um, but respecting our circadian rhythm, respecting the fact that our bodies um, respond to blue light, to bright light differently than they respond to warm, low red light and trying to emulate what's actually happening outside as much as possible. So, you know, after dinner, maybe you start turning some lights off. Maybe you use candles instead. Maybe you use red lights instead. Maybe you use um, blue light blocking glasses. I love them. I use them all the time. Actually, I took my glasses off so I won't have any glare for the podcast, but these are blue light blocking glasses. You can see that sheen. These are from Blue Blocks. Really, really like that company. Um, I've been on their podcast and they're fantastic folks doing really, really great work. Love their glasses. They're cool looking. Um, blue light blocking glasses, wear them if you're looking at screens, um, if you're on your phone, whatever. Um, you want to start avoiding screens later in the evening, which I think is probably the biggest um, piece of advice that no one takes. I know that I don't usually, working on it, I'll, but I'm being transparent. That's the thing that I probably do the worst is I'm still looking at screens. I'm watching Netflix, I'm on my phone. It's terrible, I know. <sighs> Nobody's perfect. Um, Another thing that you can do instead of just thinking about avoiding blue light at night is thinking about getting some good sunshine and blue light early in the day because that just helps set your circadian rhythm. It lets your body know this is the morning. Let's produce some cortisol. Um, let's, you know, be energetic. Let's go about our day. So if you are able to, you know, go for your walk after breakfast, before breakfast, um, go outside um, to drink your coffee in the morning, whatever, uh, that's going to help um, set the stage instead of like just getting up and maybe like immediately going to your office and working for four hours or something. Um, again, I understand that everybody has a different lifestyle and different responsibilities, but these are just, these are all ways you can start to incorporate um, better sleep hygiene and better lifestyle practices. And if you can't do them all, great. Nobody can do them all, but do as many as you can, right? Um, eye masks are another good one for um, nighttime. Um, blackout shades or curtains, hugely helpful. Um, you can actually get now, and I have some in my office, I can't show you, but they're blackout um, shades that you can just draw down, draw up, and you can get them like cut specifically to your window shape. And they reduce the light really significantly. Um, I have them in my bedroom too. And the difference that it makes is significant. Um, we are much more sensitive to light than we think. I mean, they've done studies where they are, um, I'll see if I can find the actual study. So I'm not just like talking out of my butt, but they've done studies where they will shine like a flashlight on a person's foot while they're sleeping and the person can react to it. It can change their, um, homeostasis. So like you can, you're noticing, you're feeling, you're reacting to light when you're sleeping, even when you don't think that you are. So if you're in a room with a bunch of electronics and red lights and green lights flashing, and there's lights coming in through the window and things like that, that's gonna be affecting you more than you think. So the cooler, quieter, darker you can get your room, the better. Um, Blue Blocks has some great eye masks as well. I have a really good one that I get on Amazon. I'll add that link to the show notes. Um, so, okay, so for lighting, just gonna go back through this 
blackout shades if you can, curtains, eye mask makes a huge difference for me in the summer, blue light blocking glasses in the evening, um, avoiding screens, play with candles, warmer light, red light, less light in the evening it can kind of help set the mood for just being more relaxed, right? Or if you're going to like hang out with your significant other, or you're going to, you know, just chill and, you know, whatever. It's nice to have that lower lighting. Like you don't want to have all these bright lights on all the time, I think in the evening. Um, get that blue light, get that sunlight early in the morning um, to set your circadian rhythm. So those are some kind of key points for the lighting part of this. Um, next diet. Okay. Here we go. A bunch of things you probably already heard before. You're going to hear them again. Caffeine. Be careful. <laughs> Caffeine spikes your cortisol. Um, it keeps you awake. Um, I think it has a half-life I believe of something like six hours, that's going to be really dependent on how quickly you metabolize coffee. I am a slow metabolizer. So if I have coffee after lunch, it's going to be a problem for me. So I don't, there's nothing wrong with decaf every once in a while, guys, people, whenever I say I have a decaf, like iced Americano, people look at me like I'm an insane person, but I drink coffee more for the flavor than anything else. I just like it. Um, so there's good decaf coffee, just like there's good gluten-free stuff out there now, if you need it. Like technology is happening, okay? So you don't have to drink a massive nitro. And if you do have to drink a massive nitro cold brew to get through your day, then there are some other lifestyle things we should be addressing because you don't really want to be that dependent on caffeine to get through your day. Um, but yeah, so general rule of thumb is I'd say like, you should probably be winding down the caffeine after lunchtime and a reminder that there's caffeine and other things too, like chocolate, um, tea, things like that. So just be aware of your tolerance and, um, work around it. You can find something else to drink. Okay. Um, booze, booze is bad for sleep. Everybody, even the people who have had a glass of wine to help them pass out, uh, you know that it can maybe help put you to sleep. It does not help you stay asleep. It does the opposite. Anybody who has tracked their sleep, um, sleep quality with something like an aura ring, um, you know that sleep, sorry, booze, alcohol across the board is going to negatively impact your sleep, your readiness the next day. Um, everything. It's just bad. Like it just is. Um, you can't really get away with it or get away from it. Um, with that said, people are still going to drink and that's fine. So ways that you can mitigate that is to do the old one glass of water per beverage. Um, don't maybe don't drink to excess, maybe have a couple drinks to enjoy yourself um, and feel good. But there's a difference between having a glass of wine or two, a cocktail or two, and getting hammered and then trying to go to sleep. You know, it's just going to be tough. Um, and maybe trying to drink a little bit earlier in the day. Like, I don't know how many 20 year olds are listening to this, but I'm at an age now where <laughs> I'm not really doing a whole lot of drinking at one in the morning. Um, cause I know what I'm going to feel like the next day. So, you know, you have a, a drink with your dinner, maybe another drink afterwards. Um, and then you, drink a lot of water and you're awake for a couple more hours and it usually maybe wouldn't be too as impactful. Um, so that's something to think about. You also kind of want to manage how much you're drinking period and how much you're eating right before sleep. Um, huge meals before bed, um, is going to impact the quality of your sleep because your body is going to be working hard to digest instead of, um, repair and do all the hard work that it does while you're sleeping. Your digestion is supposed to kind of slow down when you're sleeping because your body is doing other maintenance work. But if you have a huge meal and then you fall asleep 40 minutes later, um, it's got a lot of other work to do. So that could be problematic. And of course, if you drink a ton of water at night, you're going to be getting up to pee. So um, maybe you start kind of winding down after dinner with drinks where you're like having sips instead of chugging. And that's actually a problem that I have because I'm not the best at hydrating either. So I will uh, like forget to hydrate during the day. And then it's like nighttime and I'm like, oh, I feel dehydrated. And I drink a bunch before bed. I don't know why I do that. I, I really have to 
work on that one, but I do it sometimes too. And it's problematic because then I wake up in the middle of the night and I pee and then I'm wide awake and it's a problem. So, um, those are things to consider. Now I know that depending on your goals and your body composition and your lifestyle and the way you eat, some people do prefer to eat more of their calories later in the day. Some people, if you're trying to gain muscle or gain weight, um, or have blood sugar regulation issues, they are actually told and encouraged to eat before bed. So there is, you know, some uh, information out there that light carbs, for example, that you can tolerate can increase serotonin and tryptophan, which are things that are calming um, to your nervous system can help you sleep. Um, But that doesn't mean you eat a massive bag of chips or you eat like a huge sandwich or something. It's like a little bit of some good carbs that you like. Like I know some people will eat like a small piece of fruit with Greek yogurt and some honey or something. Um, And that could work for some people or not. So I'm not villainizing eating anything before bed. Some people do it. Some people swear by, you know, stopping eating at 6 PM. And then you're kind of starting your fast overnight and that can really help people. Some people want to have some quick fast digesting carbs before bed that actually helps their quality of sleep. So play with that a little bit. I just think that generally across the board, big, heavy meals, um, before you go to bed generally aren't going to be super helpful. So those are all things to think about with, diet. Um, next exercise and lifestyle. So these are just kind of some general things. Um, the whole point again, is that we want to downregulate. We want to get into that parasympathetic nervous system state before bed. We don't want to be fight or flight. We don't want to be highly stressed, jumpy, agitated, Um, high heart rate before you go to bed. You want to be as chill as possible. And most of us cannot flip that switch in a minute. Most of us, it takes time. It can take hours um, to get into that state. And I know for me personally, I'm not somebody who tends towards being downregulated or sleepy or chill. So it's not something that I can do. Like, you know, I know I'll go out for like dinner with friends and it'll be later in the evening. And my friends are like, okay, well, we can stay out a little bit longer. Cause you know, if we go home at 11, I'll be asleep by 1130. And I'm like, are you kidding me? If I go home now, it's a solid two hours of trying to relax my body and my brain to go to sleep. So I have to plan in advance for how long I'm going to be out or what I'm going to be doing based on how much sleep I want to get, because it takes me a really long time to chill. So you will know this about yourself. Um, And if it takes you a while to downregulate and you have a whole routine that you kind of have to do, just know that. And the aim is not to be stressing yourself out before bed. So this means maybe not super high intense um, exercise before bed. Um, Another ill-advised practice that I had a couple of years back, I was doing jujitsu and the only class that I could really attend was like 7.30 at night. And so I'd spend an hour like rolling and very intense sort of grappling, wrestling type work where your body basically thinks you're being murdered by somebody for an hour. Super fun, but I would leave those classes with my heart rate jacked up and it was really hard to sleep those nights because my body was in a crazy sympathetic state. Um, So yeah, I mean, maybe don't do your hardcore workouts, your really intense hit sessions, your CrossFit workouts, whatever, later in the day. Aim to get those earlier in the day. Um, there seems to be a fair bit of research that working out in the morning is good for a lot of people. There's also a fair bit of research that you can kind of maximize your performance and your gains by working out mid-afternoon, which is kind of when I prefer. I like sort of mid-morning to mid-afternoon. I'm not like a workout first thing when you get up kind of person. Um because I'm not really a morning person. We'll get to that later. Um, But depending on your schedule, work out when is best for you, but these high intensity workouts before bed are not um, doing yourself any favors, generally speaking. Uh, And other stressful stuff, right? So like the internet isn't the best place to be before bed. (laughs) Reading the news, like going on social media, watching crazy TV shows that are going to stress you out, 
just think about it. Like there are ways, like even if you, if you're somebody who really feels like you have to watch a Netflix show before you go to bed, maybe you could find a more chill one. Maybe you can watch like planet earth or something. Maybe you can read a book that is calming and maybe even a little bit boring to help you go to sleep. Something you've read before that you love, um, stuff that just helps bring you down and be calm. Um, and you can figure out and make that kind of a routine that's fun for you. You can do like your skincare routine before bed and be calm about it and relaxed and you're doing something good for yourself and it's, it's calming. I think that's what we want to aim for before bed as much as possible. And I know there are people probably too listening to me. They're like, I have two toddlers. Like, what are you talking about? I get it sort of, I'm going to get it soon. I'm going to be there with you. But I think that again, it's about doing the best we can with the lifestyle and the situation and the resources that we have available to us. So I think just because we have busier lives, or maybe we have other people that we're responsible for, um, crazier schedules, it doesn't mean that we give up entirely and say, I'm never going to have good sleep. I can't control any of this because you always can control some things. You can do the best you can with what you have. So that's the general gist for exercise and lifestyle. I think, again, get your workout in. It's good to tire yourself out physically. That's a great way to get sleepy at the end of the day if you have a problem with it, but um, avoid cortisol raising, high stress, anything um, in the later hours of the day. Okay, supplements. Supplements are a big one. Um, this is sort of like a subcategory because I, I don't want people to have to focus on this. Like this is the most important part of it. I don't want people to skip ahead and just take supplements and hope that it helps them pass out. All of these other factors are more important and more sustainable and you should be aiming for those first. Um, but I speak personally as somebody who has at times needed supplements to help. Um, and I find no shame in that. Sometimes you need extra outside help and I take it when I need it. And a couple different things that I've played with, talk to your functional medicine practitioner, talk to your naturopath, do your research, make sure you're getting good products. This is not a prescription. I'm not telling you to take any of these things. These are just options. Um, but a couple that I've tried that I've really liked, um, there's GABA, um, which is a neurotransmitter that helps calm you down. And there are supplements. There's one from natural stacks that I really like that essentially is like a precursor to GABA. That's going to help promote, um, that production, um, which I've actually found significantly helpful. There's, um, a product called L-theanine that's very calming CBD. You've heard a lot about, you know, it's the, uh, cannabinoid that doesn't get you high. It just kind of chills you out and, um, helps relax you. I could do an entire podcast on that. I actually have an IG live with the founder of Santa Cruz medicinals. Who's a great CBD company, um, in terms of like dosing and quality and type and ways you can use it. Um, some people don't find it helpful at all. I have found it quite helpful. Um, I think the issue is in the type and the dosing, um, but it's worth looking into. Um, THC, if you live in a place that where that's legal and that's something that you're comfortable with playing around with, I've found a combination of CBD and THC to be probably the most effective, um, nighttime supplement for myself personally. Um, you can use some sort of natural adaptogens, things like reishi mushroom that are um, known to be calming. Um, you can put those in teas and lots of companies have like mixes and stuff with reishi powder that can help you go to sleep, chamomile, lemon balm. These are all usually combined together, um, natural herbs and adaptogens that can help you sleep. Melatonin is another one. It's actually a hormone, um, that, uh, is part of your circadian rhythm that helps you relax at night. Um, there has been conversation in the past, I believe, about the potential for sort of abusing exogenous melatonin to the point where your body no longer produces it. Um, but there, I've been listening to more recent research that's saying that generally speaking, that's not really an issue for people. You probably, and I've said this before, with any supplement, you want to kind of have a plan to cycle on and off of these things. Certainly don't use them if you don't feel like you need them. Um, I'm not taking melatonin every night for months on end. Um, I'll take it if I know that I'm having a couple 
high stress nights or nights when I just know it's going to be really tough for me, I'll take some. Um, there can be side effects like really vivid dreams and some people feel groggy afterwards. Again, you have to do your own research for the dosing. It's going to be different for different people. Um, so, oh, and then the last one, actually another big one, magnesium. And I'm just going to plug a show sponsor right now because they make an amazing magnesium product that's by optimizers. Um, they make a product called magnesium breakthrough that I've been using a lot and it's really, really good. Um, I'm just bringing it up right now. So it has all seven forms of magnesium because a lot of the cheaper magnesium products that you'll get in like, you know, the pharmacy or whatever, it only has one type that doesn't actually do much to, um, relax the nervous system, but this one has all of the, um, seven types that are going to work to help with anxiety, calm, um, muscle relaxation, recovery, um, boost your immune system, just works with quality of sleep, um, stress levels, all that good stuff. And that is one product that I actually do, I think, take pretty religiously, honestly. Um, most people, I believe, are pretty deficient in magnesium. That tends to be sort of the one um, nutrient that we're not getting enough of from our diet. So really, really big fan of Bioptimizers, all of their products, but the magnesium is probably the one that I use the most. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to buyoptimizers.com. I'll put that in the show notes. Um, use the code muscle maven. You'll get a discount. Highly, highly recommend. Um, so that's it. So there's a GABA, L-theanine, CBD, THC, if it's legal, magnesium, melatonin, reishi. Um, there's some calming teas and stuff that you can buy with turmeric and, uh, you know, some other stuff, like I said, the lemon balm, chamomile, whatever. Um, but part of this too is not so much using these things as a crutch necessarily, but if you have like a nice reishi um, tea at night with some coconut milk and some turmeric and ginger, and it's delicious. And it's again, part of your calm down routine and it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like, okay, I'm getting ready for sleep and this is calming and this is nice. And this is something I'm doing for myself that's part of the routine that's positive and pleasant. It's nice. Um, so you can look at it that way too. It's just part of the routine. Um, and it's something you're nice you're doing for yourself. Okay. A couple other, um, undefinable sort of lifestyle factors, things that I want to mention around sleep. A lot of people were asking me like how to get to sleep earlier, how to wake up earlier. Like you want to be part of that, you know, uh, type a, go getter like self-help book community that says get up before everybody else rise and grind four in the morning that's how you get successful if you like to do that if you can do that if you're able to do that if it makes you feel good to do that fantastic i personally think that we should if possible fight less against our natural inclinations and circadian rhythms because just like everything else they're going to be different some people are naturally early to sleep, early to rise. Some people are less so. Um, there's like entire articles you can read about, are you a owl or a wolf or a dolphin or whatever, all of these animals that represent um, the different circadian rhythms, how you sleep, when you go to sleep, when you wake up. And I have accepted a long time ago that I am more of a night owl. I don't sleep in late necessarily, but like my natural kind of rhythm might be midnight to 7.30 maybe eight. Um, some days I go to sleep later than that. Some days, you know, I, I'm not usually sleeping in any later than 7.30 or eight. So instead of trying to push it and try to force myself to be tired at like 9.30 or 10, which it has never happened. So I don't know why I think I'd be able to do that. And then I just lie in bed and I'm irritated or I'm frustrated um, or I'm wasting hours of my life that I could be productive. I just respect what my natural circadian rhythm is and try to honor it as closely as possible. And again, if you have kids, if you have a job, if you have other responsibilities that have um, some bearing on when you go to bed and when you, you wake up, that's fine. And we can do the best we can to work around those parameters. But generally speaking, I just think that it's don't try to force something that isn't going to come naturally to you. If you're, if you're able to, you know, have any control over that. So that's sort of one point that I'd like people to consider. 
Um, also, I would consider for people like me who are light sleepers, who wake up easily, who may have periods of time where they naturally wake up in the middle of the night and are wide awake for an hour, lying there having existential debates with themselves, to consider getting up out of bed and leaving that space and going somewhere else and doing something for a little while. Maybe that's you go to another room and read a book. Maybe you go somewhere and meditate, listen to music. Maybe you get up and write your memoirs or something. Um, it doesn't have to be, again, anything super stressful, but I think that it can add to the um, mental strain if you are a, a problematic sleeper to force yourself to stay in bed when you're wide awake and you work through the cycle of stress and anxiety. Um, and then you start to associate sleep and your bed and your bedroom with the stress and anxiety. And I know that I did that um, because I definitely for a long time tended to compartmentalize my worrying and my stress to the nighttime. So during the day, I'm, you know, this decisive, positive, person who doesn't really worry about a whole lot. And then I get in bed and I'm like, all right, guys, it's time. Let's think about every stressful scenario that has ever happened or could happen. Let's do this brain. And that's terrible. <laughs> that's not a great way to uh, go to sleep. And I dreaded going to sleep for that reason. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to be tired. And I'm just going to think about all the terrible things that are going to happen in life. And great, like that's not very good, uh, very good plan for optimal sleep. Um, so if you find yourself waking up and either being stressed out or having a thought that you can't get rid of, or just you're wide awake and you're like, Ugh, I'm going to lie here for two hours, maybe get up and go to a different space and journal or meditate or hang out or do whatever. And eventually, if you stay calm and you're kind of working through these things um, in a fully conscious state, you can maybe work through it and find some peace and get tired again and go back to bed. I do it all the time. I spent a lot of time being in bed, stressing out with my eyes wide open before I was like, why, why am I doing this to myself? Just get up and go and do something different. It's totally fine. It's okay. And it may help you get to sleep faster. So another thing to consider. And then I guess this is just sort of a part that I should have put with the, um, like sleep hygiene bedroom setup is ideally you really want to make your bedroom a sanctuary as much as possible. Um, and I don't even know who coined this first, but a lot of people have said it, that you want to make your bed a place for sleep and for love. So sleep and sex really is your bed. You don't want to, that to be where you eat all your meals. You don't necessarily want that to be where you're doing your late night emails. Um, I don't know, like where you're having your, your stressful family meetings. Um, you really want that to be the place. This, I guess, goes back to what I was just saying about leaving when you're having like stressful thoughts is you want that to be a space that you associate with calmness and positive endorphin release and just happy, calm oasis. Um, and that's why you make it dark and soft and comfortable and cool. Um, and you only do things there that are conducive to sleep. So again, I'm not perfect. I bring my laptop into bed. I definitely don't make a habit of trying to eat in bed or do any like crazy stressful things in there. Um, but it's something to think about because it can be easy, you know, especially um, if we're home more than we have been in the past and it's a comfortable spot and, you know, we're ready to watch a movie. So we bring all our food in there. And then next thing we know, we've been in bed for 10 hours before it's nighttime. You know what I mean? Stuff to think about just there are spaces in your house for certain things. You wouldn't have your work meeting or, or um, I don't know, your family gathering in the bathroom, probably. The bathroom is kind of, you associate it with certain things, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, you kind of want to do the same with your bedroom too. So something to think about. All right. So I'm going to really try to quickly run through this again, just very briefly. Um, I will put a lot of the, uh, the key points in the show notes that you can kind of go back to them. Um, but you want your bedroom to be an oasis of calm and, um, happiness and, uh, sleep hygiene includes a cool, dark, calm, 
quiet room and all the things that can go into play to um, facilitate that. Um, for diet, you want to keep the booze and caffeine to a minimum. Um, you want to, generally speaking, not eat huge meals before bed or drink a ton of water before bed. You want to start to titrate that down a couple hours before you're going to sleep. Um, same for exercise and consuming media. You want to just create a routine, a nighttime routine, the same way you create a morning routine. You want to start chilling out after dinner, be calm, spend time with your family and your loved ones, go for a nice walk, turn the lights down low, read a calming book, avoid stress, high intensity workouts. If you need to, if you want to experiment with some supplements, there are plenty of non-habit forming and quite safe um, supplements that you can play with. And Try not to force it because just with everything else about health and, and wellness, the more you try to force yourself into a box or force yourself to change before you're ready to, um, the greater the friction and the greater the frustration. So just, you can try any of these things that I mentioned one at a time, take as long as you need to, um, do it for a week or two consistently what works for you, stick with it. What doesn't, you can discard. Um, but these are kind of the basic key points that are probably um, within all of this stuff that I mentioned. You're going to find some things that are helpful to you, um, but you have to apply them consistently. You kind of have to really dedicate yourself to it and believe that it's important because it is. Um, and that's that. So that's kind of the general gist of the Muscle Maiden's Guide to Sleep. It has helped me. Um, like I said, I, I'm not the best sleeper in the world, but I generally have good energy. I don't need to nap. I'm not waking up um, asking for a coffee IV to get through the day. So I think I'm doing a pretty good job. Um, there's always room for improvement. So like I said, if you have some good tips for me, please message me, send them in, let me know. Um, if you enjoyed this one, please share it with someone that you love who needs some rest. And that's it. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'll see you next week.